because I was like, I have mic check. And she's like, no, it's fine. We can just get there. It's just casual. We can just get there whenever. And I'm like, well, you're just going to have to find your own fucking way because in this goddamn country, in a society, time fucking matters. We have a finite amount of it. And if you say we're doing it, then we're going to do it then because I'm going to plan some shit for fucking afterwards. So I'm with the goddamn... No, you're not with no, the French. No, I'm not with the French. The French on are that. the opposite. French don't hit. Right. Well, I was about to say French this is hit. a list of fifteen things. We're in we're on two. So oh. but but here's That's the, fine. I'm really enjoying shitting on the French. It's going great. But let's just keep this in mind because I do want to go through some more of this. I'm sorry, you know no, how it's I am. Right. No, I've no, told we're you hidden, this. we're hidden. Hello, Eds. Welcome Bit back. Wasted. Welcome back to cool. another edition of Putting On Airs. Yeah, right. I'm Trey Crowder. He's Corey Ryan Forster. Doing me best, Ringo. How you doing over there? Yeah. Yeah, right. Every, everything Ringo says sounds like a question, doesn't it? Yeah, right. They go up at the end. Yeah, trails out. They go up, don't they? Yeah, right. They go like this. Yeah, we've got the candles lit. We've got the... Yeah, we do. We've lit them. They've been oh, on the whole time. Got the teapot filled. Can't believe they haven't burned out. No, yeah. But so this is Putting On Airs. We're doing another uh, stirring rendition of this wonderful and beloved podcast. Ringo, he's done well. Oh, he's done all right. He's done well, hasn't he? I kind of feel like in almost that backup quarterback type of he's uh, the mentality. One. He's the one. He's kind of crushed it hard. Meaning like he's kind of the one to be, I feel Absolutely. like. Absolutely. You know what I mean? He was like, like he, he was gets definitely all the, the fourth seat. And none of the bullshit. Like he ain't getting for sure. He's still in the Beatles, but he ain't getting stabbed in the back. Right. <laughs> yeah. In Manhattan. Nobody you know loves I mean? him too much. No, right, yeah, That's right. the deal. You want to be loved just enough. Yeah. Like, no one expects from him the things that they expect from McCartney, like being like this fucking, you know, like uh, like McCartney Shakespeare, as we've talked about. And Lennon was, like, so controversial that he got stabbed in the back. George Harrison was wild and trippy. And Ringo just, like, was like, I'm in the Beatles. Yeah, right. I'm funny. Yeah. I love to hit. Yeah. Right? And people are like, you do hit. And, oh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. And he just... He's Did you ever a, watch any of the Beatles movies? No. So my dad was a huge Beatle maniac. The and old he, lady? And I, I, yeah, I know I've told you about it a million times, but I don't think we talked about it on here yet. My dad my dad was a huge Beatle maniac, and he showed me all the Beatles movies. And like, dude, they're pretty legitimately funny. funny. Are they Monty like, Python? And they, and they, like, well, I mean, I haven't seen them since I was a kid, but like, you know, like, comedy ages <laughs> like old, milk. Yeah, old, right. Comedy ages like milk. But they, I don't know, like, it felt like it kind of held up. The right. only single joke I remember, I just remember that the movies are, like, consistently funny. And the only joke that I remember, and I liked it, and it is very Monty Python-esque, I feel like, is in one of them, I don't remember which one it is, Hard Day's Night or whatever, I can't remember. But John Lennon, throughout the whole movie, he had this old woman with him, <laughs> right? Always. He had this old woman and the and journalists would be like, who's that? And they'd be like, that's me old lady. <laughs> and they were like, oh, you're in a relationship? He's like, no, no it's just, that's me old, that's lady. Me old lady. <laughs> and that's the whole thing. And that's a great joke. But I loved it. Yeah. yeah no, that's great, wonderful. Yeah. No, that's just me old lady. I've got me old lady yeah. with me. You're taking, I? you're taking, language the way it should be instead of the way it is and turning it on itself because like people say that's my old lady and you're meant to believe that like oh that's his wife because old lady means wife and in this joke they just go no that's my old lady that's his I old, have lady. An old lady me and you went perfect. to the uh, the beatles museum in liverpool we did and i had a good time i had a good time too and I just remember there's a part in it about Pete Best, which Shoo. Pete Best, I know, dude, I know. Shoo. So Pete Best, I'm sure everybody knows. The opposite knows, of Ringo. He was the original Ringo. Pete Best yeah. was the original drummer of the Beatles, but he got removed. And I guess it's been like somewhat disputed the exact circumstances surrounding his removal from the Beatles before they became the Beatles. But the way we heard it at the Beatles Museum involved it, I don't, I don't think it was George Martin, but maybe it Maybe it was George Martin. It was actually. their manager that was like, he's got to get the fuck out. I, I was thinking either that or, yeah. 
But George Martin, he was like their number one producer. That yeah. was, he was like the fifth Beatle. The yeah, guy right. That made That's all what the, they called him was the fifth, the fifth Beatle. Yeah. Basically, they start playing these clubs in Liverpool, and they start kind of popping off, and then they get actual representation. And because these dudes had like this cohesive look, they had this cohesive feel, the manager or some agent felt that Pete Best just didn't really fit that, and they were just so, like, "You got to get rid of him." And I know, and that it's so wild, like because that that dude, that person, he didn't do nothing wrong. Whoever he was, that sure, but like, just the. It, I don't know how Pete Best did not murder that guy in cold oh, blood I would kill. Oh. later in oh, his dude. life is oh, what dude. I'm saying. Because basically they all got together and they were like in their first recording session. This one dude who was involved in the process can't remember exactly who it was, whether it was a business guy or George Martin or whatever. But somebody was like, this guy's he not, ain't it. He's not it. We can't have this bloke. we got to have a better right. bloke in here. Get him out of here. And they fucking – and that – that thing, and of that course, moment, at the time, the Beatles weren't the Beatles. They were nothing yet. But like, it's. I mean, it, dude, I don't know. I, how honestly, you I'm sick at my stomach right I know, now thinking about it. Imagine something like that happening. I can't. To you. I mean, like, it's so we've talked on this podcast before about the dude that was with Ryan Seacrest. Did we talk about that on here? I'm pretty sure yeah, that we did because he's a stand up comic. So that's our equivalent of it. But it ain't even close. What, what was his name? Who fucking knows? I know, that's, that's the, the point thing. of what, him. He had kind of a... And I've so, heard podcasts with him. He seems like a good enough guy, but... But, the, dude, that sucks. Don't get me wrong. That sucks. And that is, like, the best comparison that you can make to this is the guy that could have had American Idol but didn't have American Idol. But it's literally not even close to... You could have been the drummer. Brian Dunkelman. Brian Dunkelman. Brian Dunkelman. It's He's not a stand-up a, comic who got... The job of being the I'm, co-host of American Idol in its first season with Ryan Seacrest, yeah, he was ever. he was on it its first season. It was immediately a, a cultural phenomenon, like I saw him do beyond all reproach. And then he lost the job in between season one and season two. And like, dude, I just, I mean, again, I, he seems like a night. I just don't. I'd, I'd kill I, myself, dude. I, it, I'd like kill you myself. Said, it makes me sick at my stomach thinking about I, that. Yeah, and I, I, I don't. No, wanna, I don't want to shit on him. On the guy no, I don't either because that fucking sucks. I mean, my, my, my heart goes out point, to the, him. No, no, hold on. God the whole damn. point that I was trying to make was that's our modern day equivalent of that, and it ain't even close to Pete to Best. what happened to Pete Best. Right. And I'm not saying I'm sure that Pete Best didn't have a shit life. Like I'm sure that like the guy that was the original drummer of the Beatles probably got plenty of studio work. He probably could have made appearances. He didn't start. But still, dog. Dude, dude but still. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like, the, it's not there's the, nothing, it's like we like you referenced earlier, like they are literally on Shakespeare's level. Yes. Like, there's people like... Inarguably on Shakespeare's people like, level. like, I don't know, Bruce Springsteen, and then there's people like Steven Spielberg and people like that who, like, all hit, like, crazy hard. But I just think the Beatles are on that... Dude. That other level of... They're like Shakespeare. There will be... I think in 300 years, people will be going to the Beatles Museum yes, that me and you went 100%. to. The way me and you went to Stratford-upon-Avon. And it will probably and be more there. insane to them. Right. Because their and, legend and like will most, grow. Most people, no matter how huge you get, most people don't come close to that. Because like... And the Beatles kind of stand alone in that way. Like, there's no, there's nothing comparable. Nothing. And, and you to gotta, have been there at the beginning... <laughs> And get cast out oh, from that before it started. Like ca I can't even fathom that because you got to understand. Like, so we went to the Shakespeare thing at Stratford upon Avon, and it was. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Okay. And it was amazing. And the way that we think about Shakespeare is one way, but you got to figure that in the 1700s they were still thinking about Shakespeare as though he hit. But it wasn't the same as what we think about him now because he's so ancient. And when you get so ancient, it makes you hit even more mm -hmm. because you're, we're so far removed from this. this so the fact that we're still talking about how hard you hit X number of years later, later like the larger the, that the number lore gets, of it, the larger that number gets, the amount of the, years since you were around, the more you hit, the more you hit. The more you hit. And yeah, I right. promise you, I promise you, and I'll genuinely say this. If this earth lasts a thousand more years, 
they will be talking about the Beatles. Right. 1,000 years from now, and in and my what's funny is they the people that really get into the Beatles and what was going on with them, 1,000 years from now, the far future Earthlings who are – finding out about the Beatles and everything, even then, because I agree with you, they will be finding out about the Beatles. Some of them will find out about, about Pete, Pete Best, Best and go, <laughs> yeah. dude, yeah, dude, because that's like crazy. you brought up, you brought up Bruce Springsteen uh, a minute ago. And this is like, to me, uh, a, a good relation of, of, of how much, how much the Beatles hit because Bruce Springsteen is otherworldly. The I mean, boss, man. He's amazing! The band. Like he he's fucking a, he, rules. He's he is he is an institution. He is like one of probably like six artists that everyone thinks of when someone goes rock and roll. You know what I mean? Like Bruce Springsteen. I mean, I've told you before. I always like my my go to phrase when people would talk about the music I like and stuff. When I talk about my dad, who was like the three a B's. I would always tell everybody about my dad raised me on the three B's: the Beatles, Beatles the Bowie, boss, and Bowie. Bowie. Yeah, right. The Beatles, the Boss, and Bowie. Well, and also Skinner, but there ain't no B in that. I don't. But, yeah. I don't know this for a fact. So I'm speaking out of my butt, but it's just I I believe it has to be true, just because like bands often break up and there's like a lot of members to different like before you get to the final set that you go through a lot it it wouldn't be surprising to me that like the east street band had at one point a different drummer than max weinberg maybe before max weinberg got there Mm -hmm. they had a different uh guitarist than stevie van zant it wouldn't surprise me that there were other members of that band before the set that we know now as the East Street Band, but you don't know any of those people's name as being the lost member of the East Street Band because even Bruce Springsteen, who is a goddamn savant of music, is still not even not even a little bit close to the Beatles. Bruce Springsteen, who hits so hard, is not even no, approaching dude. the same no. ballpark as the Beatles. And again, think about how much Bruce Springsteen hits, and he don't even fucking touch the Beatles. That, so what? That, happened, there's only one that I think is even close. And it's Rolling Elvis. Stones. I was gonna say Elvis. Elvis. Oh, Elvis is definitely right. Elvis and the Beatles are the same thing. Right. They're just they're they're they're. they're Elvis and the Beatles are definitely the same thing. I, I would dude, say the Rolling Stones. I know the Rolling Stones get compared to the Beatles a lot, and dude, they hit people. Be talking about they're them, not like the Beatles. But I just, I just no. Don't you're think right. They're... I wasn't thinking. The reason that I wasn't thinking about that with Elvis is because Elvis is a solo act, right? But you're 100 percent right. They, they El- do have honestly, one thing in you common. Could, you they could stole probably, all the music from black people. <laughs> you could, well, yeah, that's true. Hit, you that. could probably. We're actually going to talk about that. Elvis in this episode. Elvis and the Beatles. You could. There's actually arguments to which one was the most that that those things were. Mm-hmm. You can't make that argument with the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. Right. You can go, I like the Rolling Stones more than I like the Beatles, but you cannot say that the Rolling Stones were more influential than the Beatles and that the Rolling Stones are going to have as lasting of a legacy as the Beatles, but you definitely can say that about Elvis. It's yeah. just that Elvis was a singular person instead of a band. Right. So we... This was just spontaneous us talking about music, but it's actually related because on this episode a little bit later, me, I'm going to be doing the Venn diagram, rich people, fancy people, trash people overlaps on being musical. Hush. Yeah. They have a musical aptitude, both fancy and trash, and we will talk about it. And then Cho, we're back to history with Professor Cho this week, we right? On the subject of what are we doing? I know what we're doing, but I'm excited to hear him say it. We're doing an addendum, ladies and gentlemen. Uh friends beyond the binary, people of all colors. I made a mistake. The last time I talked about this subject was a folly. A was veritable a, folly? A veritable folly. I decided to uh, just kind of go uh, willy-nilly on the Romanov family and their execution, and apparently I got a lot of things wrong. Upset and I, a lot of people. So many. A lot of people. The most emails. The most hate mail we've ever got. Aside from uh, if you discount things about squirrels, but <laughs> the most emails we ever got was how terrible, how inaccurate, how borderline, you said the word, not me, uh, I was 
on the subject of Anastasia and the Romanov family's murder, and therefore today we are doing an addendum, and I will try my best to clarify and make right what I got wrong the first time. This is the first ever History with Professor Cho 2.0, baby. Redux, redux. Redux. We redo, yeah. And I'm looking forward to it because I didn't know you got anything wrong me the either. first time. I thought I nailed it. Was it was all hidden from me. And I, despite all the emails and everything, I've not looked up any extra information. Why so would you? I still have no idea. I've so had I my... look forward to hearing the real version well, of it a little later. Well, Trey, since that moment, I felt so bad. I have had my head planted firmly in books about the Romanoff family. And there is literally no way that on this episode, I'm going to get any minute detail Ooh, wrong there we at go. all. Man's. This is the end all be all of the Romanoff execution. The final you can word. take that to your motherfucking grave. The final word. He's mm-hmm. got it right this time. Well, I look forward to it. One thing I did want to talk about something before we start though. You sent me this article about um 15 extremely French customs that make no sense <laughs> to the rest of the world. And it's like, oh, I can't imagine the French being like off-putting to the rest of the right. world, you know. But we're going to read through them. I have no idea how uh, accurate or based in reality this article is. That's not what we do on this show. We just say things and then go. Right. But uh, so let's start. Number one, it says never take wine to a dinner party because it says in France, the idea is that your host has already carefully chosen the wine for the right. party. So if you bring a bottle of wine, you are implying Insulting them. you are implying that their taste does not hit and you would prefer their own. It's sort of like you got your your mama bringing uh, her own casserole, casserole yeah. to your aunt's house where she made casserole. Right. And that story makes me kind of get this, this French right. custom. I get that. But like in America, we're it's so... It's not treated like that. No, because... It's like, here's an extra bottle of wine. Because we're all going to be which drinking. Which hit for everybody. Like, basically what it is is like... I'm going to be drinking. Yeah, I can't believe the French turn something into a personal insult. Right. You know what I'm going to be drinking and... What is the implication? Of these. Yes. What have you done? You don't think that I have the wine for you? You are saying that I don't understand wine? You are savage. (laughs) It reminds me of that scene. Did you watch The Office? Yeah. Okay. Uh, who was it? That Somebody I know doesn't watch The Office, and every time I say, did you watch The Office, they're like, no, actually, I haven't gotten around to it. And I'm like, motherfucker, what? Of course I watched when, The Office. When, uh, when fucking Jim and Pam go to Michael and what was what was uh, Jan? Michael Jan, and Jan's Jan, house. Jan, yeah. And they bring her a bottle of wine, and they go, hey, we brought this for the dinner. And she goes, oh, this will be good to cook with. Yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a very French uh, thing. Because, uh-huh. like, yes, you're right. Like, all it, when you bring, yes, I can feed this to the dog. Yeah, yes. right. I the can, dog will appreciate your taste. We mine. will bathe the kittens yeah, with right, it. Yeah. <laughs> so like, but like to me, when I bring liquor or any type of alcohol to a party, all I'm saying is like, here's more liquor. Here's more liquor. We're I'm, gonna, I'm, your liquor hits. Yeah, here's but we'll be some done more. with that. But we'll be done with right. that. It's a gift. Like, I don't like... No, now, yeah, dude. No one in America interprets it that and, and, way and, ever. Because more liquor always hits. And for the record, um, like, I'm uh, only recently did I even start doing that at all because, like... I know that I didn't grow up as trash as you, mm. but I did still grow up in the South where I was like, if somebody invites me to a party, that's all inclusive. You know what I mean? I'm just like, yeah, I'm just going to show up at the party. And it was only later, like when I started dating, like Lee and, and my mom was really offended when I told her this. Cause she's like, I thought yeah, I raised you better, but like, I didn't realize like that you should bring stuff to a yeah. party. And here's why, because if you come to a party at my house, I genuinely don't expect it. I genuinely don't. Like I if, would never. If I was having a party and opened the door, I got and they you. Just showed up. I got by you. Themselves, it would never no, cross my at mind. All. That, I'd be like, like cool. "What are they doing?" I don't care. Now, granted, if you bring a bottle of wine, I'm like, "Where? What's up?" But like, whenever I when I invite you to my house, I got you, dude. Mm-hmm. I got you. Whatever's in my fucking fridge. You. Whatever's in my pantry, you. Whatever's in my bedroom, you. You want to go to the medicine cabinet? Fucking you. You know what I mean? Right. But again, now that I've been taught about that, like I would never go to a party unless I had a bottle of wine, which usually in the South is always uh, received as like, oh, you didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? 
So, all right, number two, try and, al- try and arrive at least 15 to 20 minutes late. I don't. I mean. Okay, now here's my problem with this. It says, while in many countries this could be considered rude, in France it's an unspoken rule. Guests always arrive a little late. Otherwise, you may surprise your host in the middle of preparations. Now, here's my thing with don't this. Don't get just, there early. My thing with this is just like, just Make the time the actual time. time. Right. Like, if we all understand... You know how a, I feel about time. If we're time. in a culture where we all understand that, like, if I tell you it's 8 o'clock, it's actually 8.20, then, like, why can't just we say all just make it 7.40 then or whatever? Or, you Buddy. know what I mean? Just make the time the time that it is. Why do you have to have this, like unwritten rule about Hold when you, because we okay, need to decide right if now everybody shows up fa- fashionably late is a thing in america but if you show up at eight you're not going to catch them in the middle of getting ready we like, need to decide right now we need to decide right now if we want this podcast to be three hours because <laughs> i'm serious because i could talk at length about this shit and you know you know fucking good and well I am a stickler for fucking time. Yeah. However, everything you just said is a hundred percent true. Now, I, I would. Mean, I was say, agreeing with you. No, no, I'm saying like you're not as much of a stickler for time no. as me. But like in this instance, that is a hundred percent true. What I would say is like I would change this rule to don't be early. Like if someone tells you we're having a party at my house at eight, don't get there at seven thirty because then you might catch them in the middle of making the potato salad or like making their bed or whatever the fuck. But like, are you, eight o'clock, if I say the party starts at eight o'clock, get there at eight o'clock. Now, granted, I'm not going to be mad if somebody rolls in a little bit late, but Again, if that's a thing in America, but if everybody rolls in, if I say, Hey, we're hanging out at my house at eight o'clock well, dude, and I'm sitting there at fucking eight o'clock with my thumb up my ass and nobody's well, fucking there. Cause the they fashionably were, late thing is definitely a thing in America. Remember last time me and you went to a birthday party out here. The last time you we were out here, our buddy, Eddie, great dude. It was his yeah. birthday. We went, Eddie there, Larson, shout we went out. there, we were given a start time and me and you arrived at the start time. And there was essentially no one. Yes, there. that's true. And an hour or two hours later, everybody starts filing in. There ended up being a huge amount of people there. But like people do this. But my thing is the part. I'm not for my it. My thing is the part where it's like if you arrive on time, you're going to catch. They're not going to be ready yet. Then it's like I don't get that. Just that's make, stupid. Make the time whatever the fucking time. If should you tell be. me to be there at eight, when I show up at eight, it shouldn't be fucking weird to you. Now right. here's the deal: when it's a party, it's like one thing. Of course, if somebody says we're having a party tonight, now depending on your age, having a party tonight could mean a couple different things. If you're 50 years old, or honest to God. I'm 35. If I say I'm having a party at 8, I kind of expect everyone to be wrapped up by about 12. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a very hospitable person. So if you want to stay and get drunk and sleep at my house, I don't give a fuck. Party as long as you want. But I'm probably going to be wrapped up by 12. Mm -hmm. But like, I know a lot of people who take this same theory of showing up late to things that are contingent on time mattering, such as I have a dinner reservation at a restaurant. My dinner reservation is for eight. If you show up at 830, we've been sitting there for eight because that's when the goddamn reservation was. I also know motherfucking people who, if I say the movie starts at eight, they will roll into the goddamn movie at 815. And I'm like, motherfucker, they make previews for a reason. Buddy, I... I don't do those things. I know you don't. The women in my life do. Yes. My sister, my wife, they consistently are like that. And it bothers me too. I've left my wife so many times because of that. When we were, and you know this, we were in Denver uh, about to do a show. And my wife, whenever she's on the road with us, she thinks, oh, my time is the time that matters. And I have to tell her a million times, I'm like, no, bitch. Things start when they start. When they, they Things start when they start, and you're on the road with me. My time is the thing that matters. I've left her at so many hotels because I was like, I have mic check. And she's like, no, it's fine. We can just get there. It's just casual. We can just get there whenever. And I'm like, well, you're just going to have to find your own fucking way because in this goddamn country, in a society, time 
fucking matters. We have a finite amount of it. And if you say we're doing it then, we're going to do it then because I'm going to plan some shit for fucking afterwards. So I'm with the goddamn... No, you're not with no, the French. No, I'm not with the French The French on are that. the opposite. French don't hit. Right. Well, I was about to say, French this is hit. a list of 15 things. We're in... We're on two. So... Oh. But, but here's... That's the, fine. I'm really enjoying shitting on the French. It's going great. But let's just keep this in mind because I do want to go through some more of these. I'm sorry. You know no, how I am. No, I've no, told we're you heading, We're heading. Number three, kiss, kiss. It says, in France, most residents practice the double kiss greeting. You know, the mwah, mwah. Oui, I like that. Wee oui, wee oui, la baguette. Yeah. But it says... But in a lot of regions in France, particularly northern France, people actually favor four kisses, sometimes five. Wait, so maybe even but, another one. But then, but how do you not get locked into a perpetual, perpetual just kiss? Right, it should be kiss six. Off, it should be kiss six. Off. Right. When? How do you know when to stop? They, you know. While we are here, suck my dick. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah right. <laughs> That seems like foreplay, the six kisses. Yeah, well, they, you know, they got that whole thing going on. I have on. always enjoyed that. that. Pepe Le Pew thing going on. I have always enjoyed like the that. the French have weathered the Me Too storm pretty well. Do you and your... Uh, that, oh, dude. Considering it ain't, how a lot of people feel about their... <laughs> Dude, people, <laughs> their approaches to romance based on our cartoons, bro, which we feel to be, you know, concrete uh, cultural documents. My favorite thing about France is that you get sexually assaulted at the bank. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like everybody just be like, mm, 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 uh -huh. where? Because where are you at on that? Because me and my friends kiss each other. I mean, I'll kiss my friend. I don't have a problem with that. What? I, dude, me I and kiss you, you. Me and you have made out. We've before. tongued each other. Multiple times, but I'm saying I like, actually used to have a bit. And Katie listens to the show. I don't know if Katie knows this, but she'll think it totally checks out. Does she out like since this we're show? We're in love with each other. Yeah, evidently she does. I, that's that's weird. You know, can I say? Good, can right? I just say? But, by the way, shout out Katie, and uh, much appreciated that she actually listens to the show. My that's wife insane. hasn't listened. I send my wife a five second clip. If it's any more than that of anything, she's not watching it. Dude, my wife buddy, don't even know I'm here. Buddy, my wife, my <laughs> wife never, that's it. I feel like it's a good sign about this show, the fact that Katie listens to it, right. because like Katie normally, she has no idea what city I'm in. She has no idea when I'm coming back. We've had other podcasts for years. She's never listened to a word of them. Oh, that's a good sign. Right. And, but this one, she listened. I don't know if she feels like she has a vested interest in it. Because, because she designed she the set. set I feel like that, that would wore off on the that, fifth episode. Right. No, it yeah. just hits. But she just keeps listening to it. It's a good show. But, uh, but I was just going to say, I don't know if I've told her this, and she's definitely going to hear it. But yeah, I used to have a bit when me and you like, earlier in our relationship when you were still single and I very much was not and we'd be hanging out holy to, shit I was single we'd be hanging out to comedy catch and stuff like yeah. that and if you were like like had this girl you had something going with yeah, a girl right, right? I thought it was funny to walk up and just start making out with you. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. the middle of you trying to hit. And to your credit, you always just went. I thought with it was it. funny. I'd make out <laughs> with you. Yeah. With and the girl yeah. would always be like, "What the what fuck, the fuck was I, that about?" And I would and then sacrifice just like walk off. And, and I would sacrifice yeah. pussy for the bit every time. Right, yeah. Number four, always say hello and goodbye. I feel like this one isn't that weird. It I says, don't. The goodbye part, I don't agree with. It says the French apparently, even if they're going into a shop, they always say hello and goodbye when they leave. Now, I do that at a shop, but I don't agree with that like at a party. And the reason I don't agree with that at a party is because here's what I – the Irish goodbye. Do you, are you familiar with this? Are you familiar with the Irish goodbye? Oh, buddy, I'm a huge proponent of the Irish but like, goodbye, I don't even dog. Think you're, I don't even think you're being rude. I think it's being pragmatic. I'm the Irish goodbye motherfucker you've ever met. And, but the reason to me that the Irish goodbye is just pragmatic is because – I and you know this because you grew up redneck – Rednecks say goodbye. Rednecks the opposite. The redneck goodbye is like That's they'll gonna, say goodbye and they never leave. leave right. Like they'll say it but stay there for another so, 15 minutes. So I actually read this. I read this on Twitter earlier and it reminded me of a Tim Wilson bit, which is like, here's how the redneck goodbye goes. You start out, you're at a party, you start out by going, well, I think it's about that time. And then 30 minutes later, you slap your legs yep. and go, well, well, then you get up, 
you walk to the door and the host walks to the door with you mm -hmm. and y'all talk for a little bit longer. Then you say goodbye again. Then you walk to the car and you sit on the hood of the Stand car. Stand by the car. And still talk, talking. Still talking. Right. Oftentimes about the car and gas prices yeah. and whatever. Then you get in the car and roll your window down and tell everybody your final goodbyes. Mm -hmm. And that's the most accurate shit I've ever heard. And well, dude, rednecks will just straight up ignore a goodbye from somebody. It's like, like well, I got to get out of here. It's like, all right, all right okay, cool. I'll see you later. Hey, have you seen Paige lately? Yeah. Oh, shit, boy, yeah. Been... Like, and they'll just keep going. You want to go drink whiskey in my yeah, basement? Right, yeah. But like, no, that's true. And so the reason, so because of that, and I know, all, I know all of that is going to happen. So if I'm at a party and I genuinely am like, I need to be in bed in five minutes. I'm like, I can't tell her bye bye because first off, what we just described, especially is a bunch only, of rednecks. Well, what we just described is only if you're at a like one family party. If you're at a party that has like 15 to 20 people, you have to do that with everybody. If you say, hey, guys, I'm out of here. Every yeah. single person has to come up and be like, yeah. I ain't seen you in a long time. Go through the whole Dad, process. You have yeah. to do that with 20 fucking people. Yeah. So what I do now, and I learned this from my sister, is just fucking dip. They're all going to be so drunk that they're yeah, not the going to remember that you let. Out, Dude, the Irish got it fucking figured out. So I'm, I don't fuck that. All right. You know what? This is going great. There's a lot of great shit on here. I'm going to save the rest of this list. For the next one? People, yeah, give people something to come back for, yeah. by God. In the next episodes, we will revisit this list because there are more items on it, and I think we'll have something to say about it. It's everyone. so funny to me that every time we're about to do one of these, you're like, oh, I don't right. know if that's going to work. I don't know if we're going to be able to talk long yeah. enough <laughs> about for the this. French not hitting. And I don't know if we could talk about the French not hitting for more than 10 or 15 and, minutes. And every single time, uh, I look at you and go, yes, we will, yeah. Trey. And you go, you, I don't better, know. you better have something else queued I don't know. up. Yeah. I'm telling you, dude. Verbose mm -hmm. is what we both are. And we'll be right back after this with Trey Crowder's thrilling rendition of the Venn diagram of being musical. Oh, I love that. All right, y'all, the nights are getting longer, but the breeze isn't the only thing that's getting stiff. Hey, oh, that's right. This episode is sponsored by our good friends over at Blue Chew. We all know that confidence can take you far in life, guys, and that's especially true in the bedroom, especially when it's time to step up to the plate, a.k.a. the crotchal region of the one that you love. And that is where our good friends at Blue Chew come in to help stiffen up your breeze. Ain't that right, Trey? That's right. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night. So you can plan ahead or you can just be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Talking about your wainer there. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, You'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done on the internet. No visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy, running into somebody you went to school with. You ain't got to do none of that because Blue Chew's tablets are made right here in the U.S. of A. And prepared and shipped direct to your door in a very discreet package. Cho, you're a devotee. Love it. My wife loves it maybe more than I love it. I don't think we're going to go back to doing it sans Blue Chew, and a lot of y'all know, me and my wife just found out that we are going to have a uh, a beautiful baby boy, and I don't know if that process could have been completed with the rinky-dink wiener God gave me. Maybe it could have been. Maybe it could have been, but I, I, I'm not going to uh, find out uh, because I'm a Blue Chew devotee. I love the new wiener they have given me. Now, Trey, tell everybody how they, too, can get a new wiener. Well, I tell you what, if you can benefit from some extra confidence when it's time to perform... Chew it and do it, baby. Have better sex. We got a special deal for our listeners. You can try Blue Chew for free when you use the promo code POA at checkout. All you do is pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code POA to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for continuing to sponsor this here podcast. All right, guys, let's do it. It's time for me to draw that Venn diagram, make the pussy symbol, you know, make the DDP. I'm drunk, by the way. The Illuminati. <laughs> yeah, the this Illuminati. Illuminati. Hove! I about to say, Hove, Jay-Z, he did this thing that convinced him that he was part of the secret Jewish cabal that's running the world or whatever. Yeah, that we're, who loves blacks. Always love to let the blacks in. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know what that was about, but... Um, 
I had a buddy buddy once tell me that uh, somebody at work gave him a DVD, spelled the whole thing out. So, you know. <laughs> Who? So, uh, Charles. You know Charles. Oh, right. You Charles. know Charles. Yeah, yeah, anyway. Okay. That was a nice reversal. Anyway, so this, the Venn diagram, as I use this, uh, where fancy people and trash people overlap, being musical. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I need to explain that to people. I don't know because I feel like some people maybe don't know much about trash, but there's a very rich musical tradition amongst trash, amongst poor people. Yeah. But also I think you think of fancy people and you think of like violin lessons, cellos, piano recitals, yeah. the orchestra. You know, music is a big part of being fancy. Being but it, a prodigious son of a bitch right, on the cello. Prodigies, yeah, right. But there's but it's also a big part of trash culture too picking and grinning you know what i mean you both pick and you grin and to me the picking is more important but you should all, like a good picking will lead to grinning yes absolutely you pick enough you're gonna start grinning of course because you're like i'm hitting picking and grinning one and the same yeah, like right. i'm hand in hand so i looked up the sort of like you know the statistics of it. And I found this article from the guardian that found, and it was, it said it was the uh, largest musical psychology study ever conducted. And it found that wealthier people are indeed more musical than poor people, according to this study. And okay. now this, I know, right. I know you got a lot of questions. As no, I, I don't have questions. I have I read, declarative statements. As I read through this article, I couldn't help. The chip in my shoulder started firing up. I started getting upset as I read through this. Like I was, I'm already dude, upset. Even though I'm not, I'm not like I can play the ukulele, not great. Uh, but I'm not. I, I'm, you know, I'm a comedian. I'm a words guy. I'm not like a musical person. I'm not. I'm definitely not any kind of like just natural musician. Just somebody I'm an insanely musical person. I just don't happen to play any musical instruments. Right. Right. To. Because if that makes sense. No, you're I feel a like singer, for you, dude. I feel like for you're a you, singer. it's because like I can play drums. Your voice is your instrument, dude. That's, yeah, and that is an you instrument. You can sing and you pick up on things. And you have like a musical ear, but I feel like a lot of that shit comes naturally to you. So when you started trying to learn the guitar, when it did not come immediately naturally to you, you were like, "Wow, oh, this don't hit." For you're, sure, your singing is uh, effortless. A hundred percent. You the are other very stuff right. Is but just drums did come naturally. Born to you, right? Right. Uh, but anyway, so I started reading through this and I started getting upset <laughs> because, <laughs> because they just continuously found, according to this, that rich people were just so much more musically inclined and musically get, uh, talented than poor people were, especially in categories such as general musical sophistication and also musical training. Interestingly, it was the categories that seemed more objective, such as melodic memory and beat perception, that showed the strongest statistical correlation with wealth. The average weekly income of participants grew by 111 pounds for every extra point on the melodic memory test and 99 pounds for every extra point on the beat perception. So basically, for every point higher you scored on melodic memory and beat perception on musicality, statistically, you were inclined to be to make 111 more dollars per week. So like, as it went up, the more melodic memory you had, the more money you made and the more beat perception you had, the more money you made. Like, okay, statistically so speaking. My argument was going to be like, are you saying it's kind of like how statistically rich kids are better at golf than poor kids? I, but well, like, okay, give me a second. We're definitely going to get to that because that's obviously what I think. Yeah, right. But I want to read a little bit more of this first because human beings are human beings. Right. And so that's what I'm saying. That's why some of this like upset me. Yeah. I, so, no, like, I'm actually this, genuinely so pissed right the now. The report the report does suggest that one of the reasons could be a link between musical training and a general drive for socioeconomic success. 
which I don't like that either. Yeah, right. It's like, oh, no. The more Poor music, people don't want to hit. They don't want to hit. Yeah, right. exactly. But here's the quote. The reason from, I'm rich is because I wanted to be rich. Here's the quote from the study. This common factor could be general cognitive ability or intelligence, which has shown to correlate with musical training and academic achievements in a number of studies. However, considering the significant correlations between listening test scores and regional income, other possible common factors could include personality traits such as competitiveness, general test taking abilities or support from parents in early life stages which might have had a positive influence on both active engagement with music and academic achievement okay i now i'm starting to kind of get it and there's part of me that wants to go back on my argument for a second and say that if you are born more creatively and have the capacity to it, create art and do musical things and have that talent, you will make more money in your life. So it, right, obvious, it's correlation versus causation, exactly. And that's what I'm saying. I was taking it's a lot of shit personally as I was reading it, but it, but yeah, it's just. In reality, it totally makes sense. You have all these resources and everything at your disposal. You're more likely. Right. I've always said, and it's a very raven thing for me to say, but I've still said it, and it can't be proven, that if I was born a rich kid, I'd fucking play violin like a motherfucker. Right. Or piano, I'd probably speak three languages. Right. I'd also probably be a massive piece of shit a huge piece who of works shit. on Wall Street. You'd still have the same hair, but yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, the hair would be the same. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, but it's American like... American psycho shit. Yeah, this fucking... Uh, there's there's a huge correlation between musical aptitude and family wealth, but it does make sense when you consider that like rich kids are just given more opportunities and resources at an early age. They're pushed into music, and so by the time they get to a point where they're engaging in these studies or uh, you know participating in these studies, they're gonna be better than all but, the little trash babies out there. But that again, never had any of that going on, right? But again, it also does make sense that if a person is from birth gifted with the ability to have an ear for music and to pick up on all these things and have all these gifts, that they are naturally smarter and better, and therefore will make more money in their life because they're also gifted in other ways. Right. So again. I'm just kind of playing devil's advocate to what I was saying. You know what I'm saying? But like that does kind of make sense. Like if you're someone who's a virtuoso on the guitar, I probably also buy that you're smart in other ways. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And there, But there's a lot of other studies that show basically like what we're saying in that like kid, poor kids – have fewer musical opportunities available to them. They don't get private lessons. Right. They can't afford an instrument or whatever. So it makes sense that rich kids would hit harder. Can, can, at I, music. Do a, can I do a quick plug here yeah. for some friends of mine? So uh, there is a Kentucky organization called Apple Shop, uh, which supports Appalachian uh, kids. Uh, who uh, need the resources to have musical instruments and get into art and all that stuff. So uh, check out my friends over at Apple Shop. They're doing a really good job. I love them very much. And that's it. Right. And I feel like outside of classical and stuff, which I guess a lot of these rich kids are playing classical music and learning the violin and the piano and they're doing concertos and all that shit. But I feel like outside of classical music, the richest musical traditions come from poor people originally, sure. particularly, especially black people, specifically slaves. Right. Slave oh, music. Corey. Yeah, buddy. Can you take your phone off the... Oh, uh, that's my bad. Yeah. I've had it on. I've had it on. I, I was like, where? why is that buzzing? I've but had you're it good. on Do Not Disturb all night, and I took it off so that I could talk to my fucking wife. That's on me. But the but uh, yeah, slaves and their music, the musical traditions from Africa, Africa with the drum and bass and the spirituals and all that, like led directly to blues, right. jazz. Then from there, rock and roll, reggae, hip hop, reggae, all that shit essentially comes from them. And they were slaves. None of them were fucking rich kids. Right. Like all the most of the music that hits the hardest for people in this country originates 
from struggle and poverty. Of course. You know what I mean? Just like and, the also, food. and also, hillbillies have their own rich musical tradition. The right. Appalachian, you fucking. Jaw harp. Spoons. We play the spoons, yeah. baby. Give me that washboard. washboard. I'll make a hit. I'll make a hit. <laughs> I'll make a hit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got an empty moonshine jug? <laughs> yeah. It's funny because I've never really just thought about all the ridiculous things that we but make it, hit where it's but just like, like. Have you ever heard. What's laying around the yard? We'll start jamming with it. Have you ever heard, though, like an actual, like, like uh, I've heard like a hillbilly band that had no instruments other than hillbilly instruments, which is like a jaw harp, spoons, a fucking uh, like piece of glass and like a Home Depot paint bucket. Yeah. To, and they will make it. And you, you I've never heard a band only use those things i've seen those elements included with like banjo and stand-up bass i've and stuff heard like bands that, only i've not do, seen them only use that shit i've but heard I bands believe you that it has. i've heard bands only use those things and also if you go to the streets of new orleans you will often see yeah. young african-american gentlemen doing the same thing and the deal is is that you can make if you have the music in your soul yeah you can put it to whatever the fuck it is so on that note i don't think i told this story on here if i have stopped me and this doesn't have anything it's not i don't know how poor any of these people were but still on the note of what you were just saying about having the music in you first time i ever went to new orleans i went to this bar on frenchman street mm -hmm. right and what, what was it called uh We've probably been there together. We probably have. I, it was across the street from the Apple Barrel. You know, the Apple New Barrel, Orleans which is all throws is a front. Is New on Orleans top of would it? be a wonderful topic for this show, yeah. for the record. Yeah. Shout out Adolfo's tremendous restaurant. But it was uh, across. And the whole city of New Orleans. We was, love you so much. It was much. across the street. Can't remember the name of it. I'm sorry. If you told me, I would be like, yeah, that's it. But I can't remember. Anyway, I was in there and they had this New Orleans jazz band playing. All black guys up there ripping, playing jazz. And then all of a sudden, they included this tap dancer, this white guy who like, he showed up Ugh. and they started like. Like, you know, they would play to a they crescendo. They were freestyling. They would play to a crescendo and then break, and then he would jump in and fucking whatever, and then he would like, <laughs> and he would like, what? He would Well, you know what I mean. No, that and hit for me. And then he would. And then, That wasn't a me making fun then, of you laugh. And then he would like tap them back in. Right. You know what I mean? And Count them they in. Would, and they would join, and then they would do it together, <laughs> and they did, and dude, it was, it, they closed their set with it, and it was so fucking fire, and that's the first time I've ever been in New Orleans, and after it ended, I saw the tap dancer standing over by the bar, and I walked up to him, and I was like, dude, that was great, and he was like, hi, oh, yeah. he just did that, and I was like, I was like, how long have you been working with these guys, or whatever, and he was like, what? Met he, him tonight. He literally didn't speak English. Yeah. He was from Israel. Oh, he was wow. Israeli, did not speak English, never been in New Orleans, never talked to any of those motherfuckers, never done any of that. They didn't even know he was there. Yeah. He just illustrated he could tap dance and they right. fucking rolled like, with cool, it. cool, you're in. And made one of the hitness shows I've ever seen. Because like, if you're just musically gifted, you can, you do can that. just do that. Yeah. And it blew my fucking mind, dude. And I, that's also the magic of New Orleans, by the way, is like, I feel like oh, that's wonderful. the only city in this country where like... You see shit like that on the regular. So speaking you know, of speaking I fucking of fucking love New Orleans. Speaking of keeping time, have you ever seen that video of Harry Connick Jr. where he manipulates the crowd to clap when he wants them to I clap? I have seen that. Yeah. So there's no way can't I, do it. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. it's fine. But Look basically, for everyone out there listening, Harry Connick Jr. is. A, I mean, I know a lot of people think of him as just the Will and Grace guy or just the guy that you've seen on Good Morning America. But my buddy, Matt Coon, uh, shout out. I used to have a podcast with him through the screen door. He holds Harry Connick Jr. in like one of the most high regards of music. And yeah, he he's had to tell legit. Right? And he sent me this video. He goes, this is the most brilliant thing I've ever seen in my life. So Harry Connick Jr. is doing a show and every, he's playing a song and everyone is clapping on the ones and the threes, which is apparently what white people do. <laughs> like apparently white people, we don't clap right no. when it comes time for oh music. God, yeah, that checks out. And so it's Harry Connick Jr. being more of a jazz guy is used to having black people clap. And it hits harder. Hmm. 
and imagine that and they're clapping wrong and uh, and you can watch this video where we can't harry, even clap like that we can't like that. yeah right so you can see this video and harry connick jr looks at his band and is like god damn it they're clapping the wrong way and he just like in stride changes the tempo of what he's doing skips a beat just, a little, yeah. just so that they'll start clapping the certain <laughs> way and then he goes right back into Amazing. the thing so that they don't stop clapping Incredible. so like innate music ability is like insane to me i know right that's what i'm saying it's like some people i love music i was able to learn how to play the ukulele i can keep rhythm i can do all that shit but i just know that i don't have like that's one of those things that like, you're, you're poor. born with because you're poor now, Trey. there's plenty of poor people that are born with it too yeah that's, that's true. the thing i'm talking about trash people being musical like i don't know if you had anything like this in chickamauga but in salina there was the trashiest part of clay county and in that part like everybody else in salina's like yeah they're all fucking inbred up there right. you know but tell you what they can, voices of angels right. like they were all like that was the most musical the trashiest because they were like castrados right <laughs> <laughs> the trashiest part of clay county was also the most musical part yeah it's like oh, yeah dude. no dude they fucking shred up there 100 man i went because they're all doing it in church you know so, and like at Gordon Lee, like it, like we weren't like a, a complete prep school, but there were definitely some richer kids, and there was like most everybody was middle class, but there was like the richer kids, and there was the middle class, and then we had some fucking like, you know, very destitute people There's that trailer went to school. monsters, and I'm not kidding, the destitute fucking trailer monsters. Uh, we had one that like, you know, most dudes are like, they bring a guitar and they're like, here's Wonderwall, right? right? right. Well, we had this one dude who, it wasn't that, it was a fucking fiddle. And he would sit there during break in the fucking lobby of the high school and just sit there and we were just like, I mean, this is Mozart. Mm-hmm. And he ain't got a tooth in his fucking head. Right. Not a yeah. tooth in his fucking right. head. And I know good and goddamn well he didn't have no le- he didn't have lessons from like he didn't pay for lessons. Mm-hmm. Somebody told him how to do that shit, but he had no goddamn lessons. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking like everybody would be like, what the fuck is going on? He's wearing overalls. He ain't got no fucking tooth. Like he's probably dead now. But like, yeah, so I'm with you on that. It's like that thing of Goodwill Hunting was like, I could always just play. Right. You know what I mean? Yes. A lot lot of trash people that could always just play. Yeah. You know what I mean? But uh, so this is funny. I had another article that I had made made a note of. I had a link for it that was about the differences in musical taste between rich and poor. And I remembered enough to talk about it, but I just think people might appreciate this. I put it in our outline, and when I click on the link – It goes to an article that I do not remember ever seeing that says five warning signs of depression (laughs) you should know about. So don't know how that happened, but but thank you, the universe. Are you interested in music? I bet. Yeah, you don't hit. Yeah. It's like... told you before when the pandemic first started i got into baking bread for the first time Mm -hmm. in my life and when i started looking into the baking bread community on the internet i found out that evidently bake getting really into baking bread is also apparently a cry for help Help, yeah like like it was a huge overlap between like every other post on the baking bread subreddit was like hey y'all got that suicide hotline what's going on like it was just like depression and bread depression and sourdough went together like that i don't know while we're here can i do a mini clearing the airs on something that you just reminded me of from last week's episode Mm -hmm. we were talking about paul hollywood did you know that paul all Hollywood baked the most expensive loaf of bread in English history. I did not, but I mean that checks out. Yeah. If you'd asked me to guess who did that, I would yeah. have picked him. It was him. I can't remember any of the details about it, but he yeah. baked this like perfect loaf of bread and it was like fifteen thousand dollars for this loaf of bread or some shit like that, because it had like this insane almond perfect extract. Perfect crumb, it perfect was, crust. It was like just perfectly it, proved. Yeah, it was just the the sponge. The sponge yeah. was wonderful. Yeah. He didn't so, retard the yeast. So, uh, in, yeah, in 2008, he created the most expensive bread in Britain, an almond and a Rufort sourdough. Rockfort. I think Rockfort. I think oh, that's, fifteen dollars a loaf, not fifteen thousand. That's hilarious. <laughs> I think Rockfort is like blue cheese. I'm pretty sure. I might have that wrong. Oh, okay. So it's a blue cheese and almond uh, sourdough, unless I'm wrong about that. But anyway, so again, I can't. Pull I'm, up sorry. The, I'm can't sorry. Can't pull up the article because apparently I just like 
subconsciously sent myself a link to depression articles. Yeah, yeah you'll have that. But anyway, but I remember basically it's completely unsurprising. Like rich people like classical music, yeah. opera, shit like that. Like the richest people, their number one jam, classical. Of course. Poorest people, their number one jam. Fucking bluegrass. Country. country yeah. Blue country gra- music. Country bluegrass. Right. Yeah. And it pretty much. Fast stuff. It, and la, 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 which, by the way, is much, where metal came from. I was about to say, my dad, I, he, I'm not saying my dad made this up. He probably heard it somewhere else. But my dad always used to tell me, he was like, bluegrass is the first heavy metal music ever it made, is. son. Now, do you know no, this? I know. Well, we've talked yeah. about We've like interviewed like bluegrass musicians and stuff about that. And they're like, yeah, no, that's legit. It's true. And they take a lot from metal and vice versa. Like, there's a big overlap between metal and bluegrass yeah. in terms of like the technical proficiency and how they approach it and all the, that the shit. way that like, i yeah the way that i heard like there's it, a lot of mutual respect between the way, those the, two genres the way that i heard it was a lot of metal dudes dads were into bluegrass and so like not every one of them but like a lot of them their dads were into bluegrass so they taught them how to play the banjo and stuff like that but then as all kids do they rebel and they're like I don't want to fucking do that right. I want to do my own thing so they play the guitar devil. so they play guitar but they still have the same mechanisms which is right. like playing it fast I'm which start is what you do a banjo called infant explosion <laughs> yeah, right so like bluegrass is super speedy metal is super speedy and for yeah. the record I'm a huge. Those are two of my favorite Love genres them. of music. Bluegrass. I, I've got a sticker on the back of my car for forever bluegrass. But I also used to listen to Lamb of God and Snort Pills in high school, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Hell yeah! So yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much that's pretty much it for you know talking about being musical. I just think that like I think most people understand that there's again that trash people have the music in them, right. generally speaking. But we also think of rich people and again, concertos, violin classes, yeah. recitals, and all that shit. One other quick thing I looked up, I was curious how much money you made being like a classical musician well, nowadays. You have to get a patron. Nowadays. Yeah. Well they and so basically if you can get to a point where you're at the top, if you're like a conductor, yo yo ma. If you're a con, well, dude, I mean, he's on another level, right? But if you're like the conductor of the L.A. Philharmonic or the New York Philharmonic, can I guess how much you make? Yeah, a year. If you're the conductor, and that's all he does is he conducts yeah. the Philharmonic. Yeah, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Three to five hundred thousand. Okay, but, uh, but that's le- that's definitely what well, I dude. Not. But a lot of the but he then he does session stuff. A lot of the orchestra, like the members of the company, they're in the orchestra that just like I'm second oboe or right. whatever. Second oboe. They make like they make like thirty grand a year just doing or something that, like that. But I know, but I'm saying it's like they. I I don't know. I thought it'd be more just because no, that's what like, rich people fuck with. But I figured it would be more than that. But, but basically, no, no, basically, no. if you don't get to that if you don't get to the type you're not like the dude in an orchestra right. yeah you're really not making that which much that money. makes sense but i would i would also think that like someone who's second oboe if they're making and you're saying like thirty thousand dollars a year is like their salary for being in the philharmonic orchestra so most of them teach classes teach classes they teach, yeah they, right. they also do session stuff yeah, like yeah, yeah. those dudes are constantly i don't know how often oboists are getting called in for session work <laughs> no yeah. you'd be surprised though you'd be yeah. surprised at how like so if you're listening to Amon Amarth, you know, like which I uh, do. Regularly. No, I know, but like those dudes are constantly having like full orchestra stuff come in to do band work for them. You'd be surprised at how much they're like. We got to get the fucking top guy. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So like movie scores. Yeah, you right. know what I'm saying. Like if you're the if you're the fucking top oboe man for the, <laughs> it was just yeah. so funny. I know, but that the, sounds more I, redneck. I know, I know, I know, but the second oboist in the Chicago Philharmonic Orchestra. Is not the top oboe. No, man. but like they're not getting called in for that but, work. Okay, but some play, people can't afford the top oboist. So <laughs> like, give me the seventh oboe. Oboist, man. But yeah, I'm just right. saying, like, if you can really fucking crush on an oboe, there's video games that are like we're scoring this shit like mm-hmm. that. So like, I'm not. I'm just saying, like I, that thirty thousand dollars a year <laughs> just for the Philharmonic. That ain't what they're fucking making. I, I you feel know what like I'm saying. I feel like thirty grand a year in Chickamauga, Georgia, would be just fine too. Oh, bro. Bruh. Yeah, I don't know how the Chattanooga Philharmonic is doing, but not not great. I don't know. That was less than I thought it would. We be. have That's Phil and saying. his harmonica is yeah, what right. we have in Chickamauga, <laughs> and he's doing not good at all. So we will be uh, right back yeah. with history with Professor Cho on the subject of 
a addendum, Anastasia and the murder of the Romanov family. He's going to make it right, y'all. I will make it right. Right after this. Q haunted music. Michael Myers sure is scary, but the last thing you need is to be hairy this Halloween. Luckily, our friends at Manscaped launched their fourth generation performance package to be sure that your pumpkins get the ultimate carving experience this spooky day. Turn your bite-sized treat into a king-sized candy and join the six million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the code POA. Make the right call this spooky season. It's trick or trim. Fellers, y'all ever tried to trim your balls and it turned into a Freddy Krueger film? Lord knows I have. There, It's wrinkly down there. It's hard. It's no easy proposition. Shaving your balls. You know, you end up looking like a dad in a 90s sitcom with all them little pieces of toilet paper stuck all over his neck because, you know, how incompetent sitcom dads used to be. It's like that, but on your balls, which don't hit for nobody. It's difficult, all right? But luckily, Manscaped is here to save the day and make sure you're feeling your very best when it's time to put on a Halloween costume. Unlock your confidence with the Performance Package 4.0. Inside, you'll find the holy grail of men's grooming items. They've made it easy for you to upgrade your grooming routine. There's a full moon out and the werewolf, werewolf in your pants is howling. It's time to tackle that problem with the Lawnmower 4.0. Their finely tuned pube products feature a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. Thanks to their advanced skin safe technology, the Lawnmower 4.0 is easily the greatest ball trimmer on the planet. And did I mention it's waterproof too? Because it is. This trimmer is a sour shower essential. The Performance Package 4.0 also includes the Weed Whacker, which is a total game changer to your men's hygiene arsenal. It is a nose and ear hair trimmer that provides proprietary skin safe technology that helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs and all those delicate holes and crevices. They seal the deal with Manscaped's liquid formulations. Cho, won't you tell them about those? Well, Trey accidentally said sour there, but you know what won't be sour? How you balls smell after you use the crop preserver deodorant. That's my favorite thing about this because I've got big old thighs, I've got big old balls, and they get sweaty and they stink. And even after I get out of the shower, in five minutes, they go right back to their regular ball stank, but not when I use the crop preserver deodorant. It is a blessing not only to me, not only to my balls, but to my entire family because I wear shorty shorts all the time, and that stank. Well, it gets out there. So here's what you can do. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code POA at manscaped.com. That is 20% off plus free shipping with the code POA at manscaped.com. Say trick or treat to your beautiful new Halloweeny with Manscaped. All right, do it. Hey, man, how'd you like like a $20,000 raise? We can help you do that at savewithconrad.com. Don't take my word for it. Check out our reviews at conradreviews.com. We've got an A plus with the better business bureau. We've won the number one best in business award many, many times. And we just got a great five-star review. That's uh, from Jimmy E. He says, my wife and I just closed on our refinance after working with Diane and Steven. What a great experience. We closed within a month and added about a thousand dollars of monthly cash flow. Thank you. They were great. And who would have thought a trip to first family mortgage and ad free shows booth at Starcast five in Nashville would have led to this LOL. Thank you. No, thank you, Jimmy, for believing in us. I know it's crazy. You're listening to a wrestling podcast and you're going to save a thousand dollars a month. Now think about that. Add that up over the course of a year. That's over $12,000 a year. You're going to save now. How much money pre-tax would you have to earn to net $12,000? That's about 20 grand, right? And think about that. You would have had to work for that money, pay taxes on it, and then just give it away. Come on, man. Keep more of your own money. If you can hear my voice. And you're in a 30 year loan. You've got a second mortgage. You've got credit card debt. You've got a car payment. What are you doing? I can show you how to keep more of your own money, get a lower monthly payment and get out of debt faster. We're routinely helping our podcast listeners save up to a thousand bucks a month. Just like Jimmy find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. Oh, and how's this for starters? No house payments for two months. That's right. A little fall break from house payments. Sounds good to me. Find out how much money you can save at savewithconrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. And if we can't help you save some cash, we won't waste your time. One more time, savewithconrad.com. Is 
Is there more on this? Hey, y'all, you can tell it's time for History of Professor Cho. And uh, he's doing it right, y'all. He wants to get it right. So I he do. wants to correct everything he got wrong about Anastasia. He wants to redo the Anastasia Romanoff episode because so many people were so upset at how bad he fucked it up. And thousands he, of emails. Yeah, thousands. And he wants to make it right. So I guess that's what we're going to do. So let's do it. All right, Trey. So I don't know if you remember much about what I said on that episode. No, no I was... don't. I remember nothing. All I remember is that like I wasn't put off by any, any of, of it, it right. because of how Romanov dumb I right. am. All I remember is the whole time you were talking about it, I was like, oh, that's wild. That hits. Right. That don't hit. Whatever. It never crossed my mind that you were being hilariously inaccurate about all of it. And I apologize for that. And again, everything I'm about to say is 100% factual correct so we're looking at a time period trey that is uh the start of world war one you're familiar with world war one right the great war yeah which i believe it, it's called did not hit no it a lot of people hit. died war, war it was the start of germany's bullshit yeah Germ it was the first time they tried to whoop the whole world's ass yeah germany is just absolutely on their bullshit so there's this dude over in russia and his name is czar nicholas mm -hmm. now czar nicholas not only looks just like King George over in England, but because they were first cousins, they were first or, cousins. Yeah. But they honestly, looked, and also they was first cousins with some other motherfucker that was yeah. part of the whole thing. Probably there, some dude over wait, in like Spain or oh, something like that. Wait, Corey, there's two Czar Nicholases. Well, it's the other one. <laughs> so <laughs> they're probably, but dude, I mean, of course, all those motherfuckers were cousins. They like with all everybody. came from the same papa. They all came from. There's the like same, three or four dudes they, involved with this that all came from the same papa. Papa Nicholas. Papa Nick. I believe there's Papa Nicholas. Then you've got Czar Nicholas, and then you've got King George, and then you've got that Spanish motherfucker that I believe was their cousin. Don't look me up on that, but I believe was their cousin. So World War One's going on, and like Germany is like up on some fucking bullshit. Which I know is probably not surprising to you. No, so, yeah, they stayed up on their bullshit. So you've got the, when Germany's up on some bullshit, they start the, uh, what is known as the Axis, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got the, if there's going to be an Axis, there must be some allies. So the allies were uh, Great Britain, America, France, Spain, Sweden, and Australia, right? Mm -hmm. So those Pretty are good crew. a great crew. Bunch of fucking rednecks ready to fucking go. Mm -hmm. So World War One starts, and everybody's just like, okay, like things kind of don't hit here in Russia. Like it's kind of never hit to be in Russia. That's what I've always heard. Yeah, it's kind of the, uh, that's the uh, narrative, mm -hmm. I would say, of Russia is that it don't hit. But they were There's just vodka. like- vodka. That hits. Right. There's but, bears. I don't hit. But they were like, well, we're at war, though, so at least we have, like, a common enemy. And, like, as we all know, like, uh, uh, any all any country needs is a common enemy mm -hmm. for them to unite, which is like, you know, it's not like we weren't divided in September of 2001. Of course we were. Al Gore had just uh, been defeated by George Bush in a highly contested... Was he, though? Exactly. Anyway. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Exactly. Was he, though? And everybody was in fury about it. But then 9-11 happened, and we can come together. Al Gore, friend of the show, by the way. Absolutely, my friend buddy, of the show. My and buddy I'm, AG. Yeah, and thank and you. And he is AG, just so y'all know. He is, an, he is AG, and he also sent us some of the best barbecue and whiskey I've ever had in my life. So mm -hmm. thank you. Al Gore but you do know at that point like the America was divided we thought there had been collusion in the election we thought that someone had been wrongly elected and by virtue of that someone had been wrongly defeated but then this little thing called 9-11 happened mm -hmm. and we had a common enemy mm -hmm. so when there is a common enemy it's often that people set aside their differences and go you know what sure but fuck that well, Russia had pretty much the same thing going on in World War I. They had a common enemy. A bunch of bullshit was going on. And here's the deal with Tsar Nicholas. So, like I told you, Tsar Nicholas was King George's cousin, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, 
Czar Nicholas, all this bullshit's going on, and he's on the opposite side. He's on, like, the Axis side, right? And then his cousin's on the Ally side, but he is like, you know what? Fuck this, man. I can't, like, I don't want to be, like, get dead. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because, like, you don't want to get... No, getting dead ain't it. So he was just like, yo, cuz. He was like, yo, cuz, help me out, dog. And King George was just like, yo, cuz, I love you, bro. I really do. Like, you're my favorite first cousin that rules Russia, mm-hmm. 100%. But it just doesn't look good for me to, like, help you out. So, like, nah. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, yeah, like, nah. And, like, look, Russia don't hit. I thus decree, no. Russia, right. Does Russia hit? No. Russia don't hit. No. Now, the Russian people are fine. I know there's a lot of innocent people there who've never done anything, but Russia as an idea, as a country, they don't hit. Do not hit. No, they, 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 uh, uh, they don't hit. But, like, here's the deal that I got wrong on the last episode, is that I acted, though, as that since Russia don't hit, that must mean that Tsar Nicholas and his family didn't hit. And I somehow painted it in some way that they uh, didn't have any amount of opulent wealth, which is completely wrong, and I apologize for that. Tsar Nicholas and his family not only were the uh, uh, leaders of Russia, uh, had an immense opulent wealth, they also ran a uh, circus in Russia. Oh, so I had bears on unicycles. There and you stuff? go. I thought you were going to bring up the bears. So you know that Always. bears are huge in Russia. Huge. Dude. And Zar, they play poker with them. Zar, so Tsar Nicholas not only was the leader of Russia and the Tsar, which is what uh, that means, he also was essentially like. The uh, what was the guy that Hugh Jackman ring master, played? The yeah. ringmaster. Yeah, yeah. What was the guy that Hugh Jackman played? He played P.T. Barnum. Didn't P.T. He? Barnum. So, Tsar Nicholas was essentially like the P.T. Barnum of Russia. All right. It would kind of be like if Vince McMahon was also the president of the United States. I can you know see what I'm it. saying? I could see that too. It makes sense here in America, but like back then, that's kind of a wild thing to think about. But he was so Tsar Nicholas ran a circus with him and his family. They trained bears. They had bears on unicycles. Um, They had a bearded lady, which was actually, Trey, their cousin. And you know how every royal family kind of has that cousin with the Habsburg jaw that like... Well, yeah, they're all inbred and stuff. Right, exactly. Like, this cousin is uh, an effect of two brothers uh, fucked a sister one too many times. So, like, their bearded lady was their cousin Madria, mm-hmm. which I don't think is a Russian name. Maybe that's just what they called her. But mm-hmm. they had their bearded lady Madria, which was their cousin. So, Tsar Nicholas ran this sort of, like, Russian circus that was, like, propped up by the government. And because of that, a lot of people thought they're like, okay, so... This guy's running the country, but he also has one of the most profitable zoos and circuses in the world. I think this is kind of a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Like he's Mm -hmm. like because he's the czar, he can force everybody to go to his circus. Right. And he's kind of just like lining his pockets all over. Right. Yeah. Right. So like that did not hit for them. Okay. So. Inspired by the French Revolution and by a lot of revolutions that have already happened, the communists of Russia were just like, we can't have a circus man Mm -mm. as our leader. No. Right? So the communist you need a book man. Exactly. You need a book man. Dostoevsky Mm -hmm. or um, another Russian Mm -hmm. book Mm -hmm. man. Do you know Mm -hmm. another Russian book man? Mm -hmm. Tolstoy. 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 We need a Tolstoy. Oh, you're Him and his cookies. (laughs) So... Tchaikovsky. So basically, Tsar Nicholas has no idea any of this is going on because in his mind, he's just like, I run the circus. People love me. I bring enjoyment to everybody. And like, of course, I spend and I have opulent wealth. And like, maybe I'm not worried about the budget. But at the end of the day, I've got a bear on a fucking tricycle. I've got a bearded lady. I've got a trapeze artist. Are you not entertained? Come on. This is what we do. Yes. The, this man. This will, is purpose of circus. He will juggle. Yes. Clown kill himself. What is problem? Exactly. You cannot afford potato, but look. 
And bear has torch. Bear <laughs> he cooked the potato with yeah. the torch. So, <laughs> so he genuinely doesn't, like, in his mind, he can't fathom that anyone would dislike him because in his mind, like I said, he's like this Vince McMahon type person. Mm-hmm. But apparently there's this communist uprising. And if a lot of people don't know what communism is, uh, mm-hmm. I'll explain to you what communism is. Mm-hmm. So basically back then there was uh, two forms of government. There was parliament and there was capitalism. And uh, parliament was where a bunch of dudes wore wigs and they decided on laws. And then capitalism was where a bunch of dudes didn't wear wigs and they were just like, this is what it's going to be, right? Right. So there was this other group called the communists that were just like, I don't think either one of those works for me. And what I think that we should do is like, you know, if... uh, Seize the means of production. Seize the means of production. Mm -hmm. Like, so the communists' whole pitch was just like, hey, you got apples? My apples. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I got cucumbers? Your cucumbers. You know what I mean? You got bear? All apples belong to every Russian, but must stand in very long line to get apples. And they are frozen. And sometimes... Apples not there. And, and they are frozen. They're not so great apples. Teeth will break. Yes. Right. Yes. So the communists were making this huge plot against both of these parties because they were like, you know what? The two-party system is bullshit. We need something to be more forward. We need a more forward party. Right? So the communists are on this tip. Again, Tsar Nicholas has no idea that any of this is going on because he's spending basically most of his time being a bear trainer. Right, being a bear trainer. So one day he goes back to the palace. It's him, his wife, his eight kids that I don't know shit about, and then Anastasia, who we all know uh, was voiced by Meg Ryan in the movie. Mm. They go back to the house. They got Rasputin with them, which Rasputin, do you remember Rasputin? Big old dick. He's got a huge dick. dick, and Rasputin boy. was also a genuinely magical person. Like right. Rasputin floated, mm-hmm. like, like obviously at the circus they had a lot of tricks, but Rasputin would like come in, mm-hmm. he would float, pour he, salt everywhere. Yeah, he would pour salt everywhere, make things disappear with mm-hmm. the salt. Mm-hmm. He was just a he was a magical human being that luckily Tsar Nicholas had on his side, which was like his main um make defense. your virginity disappear. Get it away. That's chastity belt. Mm-hmm. I got the one yes. for you. The Houdini of chastity belts. That's Rasputin. Rasputin he did. Was. I, he reportedly had a, I think, twelve inch dick. Big old uh, dick. that he only ever so let small. people see eight inches of. That mm-hmm. was his whole thing. He's like, I'll pull it out, but not that much, mm-hmm. right? So Tsar Nicholas uh, doesn't know any of this bullshit is going on, but there's this huge uprising. So one day he goes back to his palace with all of his kids, his wife, and then Anastasia. And the group of soldiers comes up and they're just like, uh, hey, uh, things uh, do not hit. Uh, you do not hit for us. And uh, I would assume that we do not hit for you. Mm-hmm. So Tsar Nicholas is just like, oh, what, what's going on? Because he don't talk like that. You know no what I mean? shit. No, of course not. He was like British with all them motherfuckers. Oh, you know okay. what I mean? Yeah, of course. Like he was. I like, knew they had the same papa, but I nah, thought maybe, he was British. I thought maybe his papa shipped him off to nah. be Russian. Was he like a Cockney guy? No, nah, he, he he sort of sounded like this. So Zol Nicholas sort of sounded oh, like this. Okay. Yeah, he was of Cockney guy. Right. So you not like the bears? What's nah, the problem? No, nah, of course. So like he's uh 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 um like he's controlling all of Russia, but he's not from Russia. It's just like you know with the colonization, right. like they all came over there. Hmm. Got this country for my birthday. Yeah, exactly. He got this country for his birthday. That's exactly it, Trey. Right. right. So, Saul Nicholas is confused. He goes back. All of a sudden, there's a stench in his room, right? There's a stench in his room, and he can't quite put his finger on it. He's like, is this horseradish? Is this mustard? What the... F-? And by, by the time he's finally thinking about what it could be, boom, he's on the ground, right? So he's on the ground, and the next thing you know, he wakes up in this room, and there's all these Russian, Soviet, just extremists in a room pointing guns at him, and he's just like, what the fuck is this? I don't know. What, what's the meaning of this? Me and me brother, me and me cousin, was mm-hmm. just talking about, I have the circus, you know, yada, 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 and they were just like, uh, you, the def- defy russian law you have your bears you have your circus you have your bearded lady which frankly 
we do not care for. Mm-mm. We mm. do not care for. In Russia, mm-hmm. lady bears you, mm-hmm. right? So Zara Nicholas is just like, what fucking gives? I thought I was doing a pretty good goddamn job. And next thing they do, they line them up uh, across the wall. They fucking just start blasting at them with AR-15s. Now, fortunately for Zara Nicholas, before him and his family had gone down to this basement with these people, they had lined uh, their clothes with a bunch of jewels because they mm. were, because, because Zar Nicholas had a, because every circus person, okay, and I, I think that a lot of people don't understand this about circuses, but circuses are town to town, okay, town to town. And Zar Nicholas had sort of gotten in that rhythm of like, okay, we've made the circus as good as we can in this town, but they've seen all of our moves. They've seen the trapeze. They've mm. seen the the cycling bear. They're not going to fall for it the next time. Right. We have to move on. Need new peasants. Need new peasants, right? They get Gullible the trick. Gullible peasants to fall for bear trick. Exactly. Yeah. So knowing they had to leave town, they sewed all of the jewels that they had bought with money from the circus into their clothes, right? right. So then they are lined up and shot for treason, which, again, they didn't even know that they were like – in jeopardy of right and they all of a sudden they're not dying because the fucking bullets are banking off of all these emeralds that they have bought from old circus monies so the goddamn soldiers are just like holy shit it's it's true rasputin really is a devil he really has put a reverse curse on these people and they can't fucking die what the fuck is going on now, of course, eventually, after about 50 rounds of an AR-15, which was definitely a gun that they had mm-hmm. uh, in Russia at this time, everybody dies except for except for Anastasia, who, because she was so tiny, was able to walk out of the service door that they had mm-hmm. in this basement, mm-hmm. escape... And then she uh, was able, obviously, to write her telltale book uh, that was that ended up being uh, the inspiration for the movie Anastasia. And she personally requested that Meg Ryan voice her because she liked her in Sleepless in Seattle. Yeah, I can get that. Meg Ryan yeah. was very charming at the time. You know, I mean, I feel like it's hard to pick a better, you know, a better person to to you know tell your story. Sure than meg ryan i wonder about the bears like were they okay? what happened to them yeah did they make it out all right yeah i don't know i mean like the way that i think about it is that like there's no reason for the russian guards to shoot the bears because the bears it's not like the bears can go tell any secrets right you know what i'm saying and they can be retrained they could be retrained yeah right they could be they retrained were, to be communist bears right like they were clearly loyal to the romanov family but once the romanov family was gone like it's still a bear and i still feel like they could just be like i don't know what up but like I've never heard, I don't have any information on this. Like, I haven't looked anything up mm-hmm. on the bears, but I would have to assume that they're not going to waste, like, good bears. You know what I'm saying? No, yeah, dude. You got to put those bears to work somehow. Yeah, Again, for sure. I mean, already... they rode tricycles. Right. You could right. teach That's them to drive saying. a tank. That's what I'm saying. They're like, yeah. they are willing to learn. For sure. And to show up and for sure. work for the glory yeah. of Mother Russia. Yeah. So, like, you wouldn't just shoot that bear. No. Not, not one that was able to, like, like, you have to understand that, like, there's only a certain percentage of bears that have the cognitive ability right. that Russian bears that you can train to ride a bicycle do. Right. So when you have that type of bear, you can't just throw that away. Mm-hmm. Now, there might no. be, and I've read this. but I've wasteful. Well, I've read this before. There definitely is, like, a period of time where that bear kind of sort of goes into, like, some sort of, like, a allegiance relapse or something like that, where it's like, my people are gone, I knew this way. But, like, if you can get the bear out of that, like, it clearly has... his th- That bear's intelligent quotient is so much to where, like, it can be relearned, you know? Right. Yeah. And that's... I mean, that's all I know okay. about it, but I just wanted to get... Make well, sure that everybody. You, I'm glad you cleared the air. Yeah. yeah. So I just make, sure, to make sure. Hey, um, email uh, putting on airs at yeah, gmail.com. Comments or questions about that? Any notes? 
Yeah, because I, I'm pretty sure I nailed it. But if, mm-hmm. if not, then uh, enjoy this uh, portion of Clearing the Airs. Yeah. Thank y'all so much. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Royalty and rednecks are alike. They both like cutting and picking fights. Biscuits and baked beans where they don't belong. Sit on down with Corey and Trey and learn some fancy shit today. We'll laugh a little even when they're wrong. They'll take you to a magical place where if you call someone a cut, nobody cares. They keep it debonair at putting on airs, putting on airs, putting on airs, putting on airs. Well, how was uh, how was New England? Super Man, it white? was great. It, you have a it have was... a white old time. I had the whitest time that any person has ever had. We we got there at the, like, we just scheduled this trip because it was Amber's fall break, but we got there and everybody in, uh, we were did New England, we did Vermont, and everybody in Vermont was like, oh, you guys have no idea how lucky you are. You're in the, the, the like, 11 to 12 day window where the leaves are changing and falling, but not completely gone. It was awesome. I ate my weight in chowder. I bought so much maple syrup. It's ridiculous. And we really did. It was just one of those lovely, quaint little vacations. We stayed in bed and breakfast. We didn't stay at any chain hotels. Uh, we, it was just, it was just lovely. It was lovely. We saw some lighthouses. We ate so many lobster rolls, dude. It was, uh, it was great. It was wonderful. I missed you though. I did miss you. Yeah, that hits. I think I did okay last week. Still didn't listen, keeping that going this week. Matter of fact, you and I don't even know what uh, what they no just listened idea. to, do we? <laughs> no, no, I don't. We are as uh, we're recording this, uh, have we're not no sure fucking... which episode you've just listened to, so we don't even know what to apologize for. Uh, we don't but... know what air to clear, as it mm-hmm. were. No, me nope. and Trey have me and Trey have both been uh, busy little bees in uh, in our uh, various other projects. And Russ is working extra hard behind the scenes to make sure that the whole operation doesn't shut down just because I'm a stupid, dumb, dumb head. So, no, we don't know what you've just listened to. I do assume that it was us being funny and dumb. Mm -hmm. I can pretty much guarantee that. Last week was the wine tasting episode, if I'm, if I'm, that's the one I missed, right? Believe so. But as I stated, (laughs) as I, as I stated already, as I stated already, I once again made it clear last week that I had not listened to it, and so as such, well, I figured that now that it's been a week, not know maybe what to say. Yeah, you just no, might have uh-uh. scrolled through the feed and saw the title. Yeah, I, I think it was that. I mean, hell, I wrote yeah. the description for it. I'm pretty sure it was wine. Right. It's just I can't remember if wine tasting was last week or the week before. Yeah. that's all. I mean, it definitely came out recently. But Time I ain't listened to it, and I don't know what this week is. I've been thinking because you know we've yeah, had, we were out doing, of episodes. Yes, me yes. too. I, I have like, well, been God because like, we hit, tasting. We hit a part like we we but they've been slightly different in recent weeks. Like you talking about just Which English dudes for that, people, English dudes that hit. Now we got the wine tasting <laughs> episode, all this stuff, and like by in my recollection, by the time we got to those, like. We were almost done, I thought. Right, but me yet too. Russ, so. But yet Russ keeps having episodes to put out somehow. We, so. Dude, it is. I I, and I, I I swear to God, if you put a gun to my head and said, name one thing left from this batch that either of you talked about. Not yeah, just right. you, not just a prep, that either of you talked about. I, I would be dead as fuck. And I, I know. know that they're good because me and you have never once sat down and thought, let's just shit this one out. Like that's never happened. So like I don't know. Who fucking knows? And uh but we are gonna be getting back together I say fairly soon. We've both got a lot of bullshit going on. So there's gonna be some more unique episodes that we uh Hope you enjoy, and I think you will. Uh, I'll go ahead and spoil it. There's probably going to be a couple episodes, at least one episode that you'll get to uh, get to you'll be, get to be in the past with us while we are. Well, they aren't being used to that. That's well, true. That we part. stay in the past, uh, but then we'll be back together uh, soon. Going to record some new episodes and uh, got a lot of cool things coming like as always by the way any suggestions you have for topics or additions to the show you can email those to us at putting on airs at gmail.com and speaking of putting on airs at gmail.com trey crowder i have airmail if you'd like me to read it 
I would. And not only that, I don't have to email it to you this time because I finally got my prescription glasses and I can mm -hmm. fucking see and it's not uh, a nightmare. So here we go. Hey, uh, this is the subject line. Cheese from. Oops. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, y'all. Matt from St. Louis here. Feel free to use my name. I love that we have to get that. Uh, my partner and I have some pretty strong opinions on Velveeta cheese. <laughs> uh huh. In short. I think the shit is amazing and a testament to the wonders of science and food engineering. While mm -hmm. she stands firm that it's an abomination, a true example that just because science can do something doesn't mean it should. The nuclear bomb of the food world, if you will. And it was during a passionate debate that I stopped and audibly yelled in the car, cheese, those motherfuckers need to talk about cheese. The shit is most certainly an example of the trash and class Venn diagram. Could not agree more. Anyway, POA has become my most anticipated podcast drop of the week. And that's saying something because I'm one of those D-bag millennials who listens to too many podcasts and won't shut up about them. Fuck them soulless squirrels. Much love, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt's super hip for me. Uh... Damn, dude! I thought I I thought cheese had like come up or been. Uh, I, I did guess. too. That's wild. It's maybe it does in one of these episodes that we don't know. Right? I mean, I've got you know notes what? from all the things I've talked about before and stuff like that, and I'm not seeing it in here, so I made a note of it. Although it would be funny if I like if like if this episode is one where I talk about cheese a lot, you know, and then now. Yeah. In the post episode, I'm like, I can't believe we never talked about cheese. I really hope raving. that happens. Yeah, yeah it would be raving. Uh, subject line here: Medicinal ear candles are a scam. This is from friend of the show Chuck Cora, host of the podcast iPod Latcha, which I believe both of us have been on. Uh -huh. Airheads of state. I wanted to comment on something that was mentioned a few episodes back about burning candles in your ear for health reasons. I think uh -huh. the Florida episode. My mom tried that candle bullshit with me at least twice, and all it did was make me pissed at the world. I used to get bad ear infections, and we didn't have much money, so if we could avoid the doctor, we would. Our neighbor suggested burning these medicinal ear candle things in our ears to cure it. We trusted him because he was an EMT, though he spent more time playing EverQuest online than driving an ambulance. Anyway, we went to his house, and I laid on the couch as this sad excuse for medicine burned in my ear for what seemed like forever. I started a Goofy movie while it burned and got clear to the part where Goofy and Max go to Possum Pete's before I called bullshit and my fat 10-year-old ass got up and left. I wasn't going to let this fake medicine money grab ruin the greatest Disney movie of all time for me. Anyway, these things are a lie. Keep doing what you do. Skew. Yeah. Uh, I, don't... I figured as much. Yeah, I mean, I think I even knew... <laughs> I can't remember what I said about it, of course. Uh, I guess I just sort of rolled with it, the fact that it existed. But I definitely, like, assumed that they didn't really do nothing. Yeah, know right. Know I mean? One of them hippie bullshit things. One of them hippie bullshit things, yeah. All right. This next one, subject line, bocce ball? Yeah. Hey, fellas, first off, I adore your show and everything in this universe. Corey, Trey, Drew, Smart Mark, and the Indian outlaw Tushar Singh have been instrumental to my mental health and well-being during this pandemic shit. Much love to you all. I also have to say that, as an Italian-American, y'all's Italian <laughs> accents... <laughs> <laughs> Y'all's Italian accents and meatball references are awkward, they are offensive, and they most definitely do hit. Okay. All right, <laughs> thank, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that we were about to be a canceled. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, having said all that, I must now rip Corey and Trey a hot new one. During the episode about lawn games, which hit, by the way, you make a reference to bocce, but commit the cardinal sin of calling it bocce ball. Bocce, yeah. is, bocce is a sport related to the bowls, bowels family of sports. The goal is to get your weighted balls closer to the palino, pay, palino than your opponent. Anyway, love you and your work. Keep on keeping it debonair at putting on airs. Sincerely, Dominic, a meatball American from Massachusetts. P.S. <laughs> P.S. You're right. Napoleon was Italian as fuck. T-shirt idea? Question mark. Hilarious. That hits. Dominic hit for me. Uh, yeah, I. That don't surprise me at all. I, correct me if I'm wrong. Any like, 
I think that bocce ball thing is one of the th- like is an example of the South just soccer versus football. I just have heard people call it bocce ball, but only like in the South and p- where we don't know about you know spaghetti stuff or whatever. Right. Yeah. I I never like knew at that some there point was some old boy point. just put ball on ball. the end of it because like it right. involves balls, you know. Yeah. Right. So it's like, you know, football, baseball, basketball. We like to put balls where they don't belong. That's, That's a, a bocce thing ball. We do. Yeah. Like we like yeah, we call if if you have a pair of shorts, they're not just shorts, they're ball shorts. I guess you all I'm really mean? trying to say is that like you and I didn't uh like come up with call referring to that as as bo- right no as it was bocce ball. That's a, we're it, just all other stupid. people do it so we're all wrong is what i'm saying there's yeah. a whole region yeah. that's wrong about it but uh appreciate the correction and this last one here lasts for a reason because it's lengthy uh this is a uh long time contributor here to the cta and i was going to say well i shouldn't i shouldn't read her email again because i've read so many but then i remembered that i actually said on the last podcast it's like anytime you want a message back i'll read it so have to uh, this is from our friend Lady S. The subject line, Hispanic Rankings Part 2 <laughs> slash, <laughs> slash, slash Beans Part 2. I mean, buddy, when I saw that as a subject line, I was like, well, I mean, for the love of God. Oh, yeah. So, hey, guys, Lady S. for the third time. It looks like Heather and I are unofficially part of the POA family. No, nah, it's official, baby. Uh, I'll try not to let it go to my head. Sorry if this comes to you guys after recording Clear in the Airs and we have to save it for next time. I'm a job. I'm a job stealing Mexican, so I've been busy with 2.5 jobs this whole week. I work seven days a week, and man, is it killing me? Okay, cornhole, dude. I'm with Corey on this one. I write gobs of gay fan fiction. <laughs> gobs. I write gobs. <laughs> I write gobs of gay fan fiction uh, on Ao3, and I can tell you, I've never once thought of butt sex when thinking about that game. Trey, wait a minute. To- hold on. Wait, hold on. No, no, no. That that's not how I remember that. I remember hey, this me. That's how I remember it. How how do you remember it? What was the argument me, we had? About I remember it? me being like, "Oh, I've never thought about it like that." And you direct oh. quote said, "Are you a fucking idiot? How do you yeah, not yeah. think of it like that? You goddamn moron! Maybe if you went to fucking college like everybody else, you would have known." I guess you piece okay, of now, shit. Now you I do bald, remember. Yeah, yellow never mind. Piece of shit. Never mind. I stand by that. Yeah. Yeah, right. The idea that, that, I mean, it's, the innuendo is self-evident and very apparent. you're gross. Your mind's in the gutter, I think, is what everyone fucking knows it. (laughs) Not me and Lady S, who You think something that fucking rednecks came up with and then called cornhole never involved butt fucking in any way? Like Uh, I'm not saying it didn't. I'm just saying I'm not gross and I didn't think of it. And I have someone here who has written... And I quote, gobs. gobs of gay, which I think is okay. a group of gay men. It's called a gob. Uh, <laughs> gobs of gay fiction. Okay, so anyways, Trey, be nicer to Corey. He's your buddy. Maybe because I've never heard of cornhole in that context until you guys started talking about it like it was a popular euphemism. I just say anal and butt fucking, but I guess everyone has their favorite code word for sex acts, I guess. Moving on. If anyone wants the bean recipe, they are welcome to it. You can put it on Twitter or wherever it's so easily available for others. This is actually an alteration in my dad's recipe, but recipes are meant to be shared and enjoyed, so have at it. I made a mistake on the Hispanic rankings, and again, these are the opinions of an 81-year-old woman that only has a fourth-grade education, so bear that in mind, airheads. My abuelita, which is the Spanish grandmother, my abu- abuel- abuelita is never mean to people. She just talks shit after they are gone when people she interacts with annoy her, like all old people. And, you know, being prejudiced hits for them. <laughs> so, updated racial ranking system from her abuelita. Cubans hit, but not in Florida. My girl. <laughs> My grandma likes Cubans everywhere but Miami, LOL. Or maybe she dislikes anyone from Florida and just doesn't know it. She said they go crazy over there because of the wet foot, dry foot policy. I don't know that one. And act like they are so smart for maneuvering the immigration system. It's obviously so early for everyone else to immigrate to the U.S., right? 
Uh, nope, it's just a Cold War era policy that favors the right types of Hispanic because communism didn't hit for America, but fascism, I guess, still does. Damn right. Don't ever get her started on banana republics or the CIA ruining Latin American countries and then trying mm -hmm. to backpedal like they imploded on their goddamn own loud cough crack epidemic. You guys touched on that and well read last week, too. Could be a good segment for Professor Cho to look at the families that got richer than all hell. Chileans hit. She likes the shape of the country and that they have penguins on the southern tip. <laughs> well, that's, those are good reasons as any to, you know, I agree. to, to like rank a a people in a, in a place highly. Yeah. Colombians. <laughs> Colombians don't hit. This is mostly mm. <laughs> this is mostly because of all the drugs. But she likes the food, so the culture hits for her. Just not the cousin fucking or the government. Former banana republic. Venezuelans super hit. One of her friends okay. she goes to the Y with is Venezuelan, and if Christina is Venezuelan, then Ven Venezuelans hit in general. Arepas su hit super hard for her too. She also feels sorry about all the fascism they have to deal with and the famine. Guatemalans don't hit. She said it annoys her when she has a yard sale and they, quote, try to haggle that hard. It's already overpriced at a dollar. Pay me or leave. Don't try to get it for a quarter. It's ridiculous how cheap they are. <laughs> oh, God damn. Guatemalans, the, uh, well, I'm not going to say it. You're wondering, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The what of the what, Corey? You know what I mean. The, uh, <laughs> Soft J, if you're wondering how she knows they are from Guatemala, Hispanics are generally really good at picking out regional accents and dialects. She also has a problem with the Mexican state of Oaxaca, pronounced pronounced Oaxaca, for similar mm -hmm. reasons because, quote, they are basically Guatemalans. <laughs> this is probably... <laughs> This is probably her being against poor people, despite her being one of us. She has eight kids that support her, so she forgets what truly struggling feels like. I bet we all know someone like that. Peruvians still hit super hard for her. She just wanted me. I, I just now realized what is going on. The grandma read her list and was like, no. <laughs> yeah. Peruvians still hit super hard for her. She just wanted me to add that any Latin American country was some great Mesoamerican ruins are going to hit for her. Who doesn't love to visit big ass buildings and wonder how they made that without modern tools? Heard that. Puerto Ricans, quote, they're fine, I guess. She's neutral about them, possibly because she equates them more to Americans than other Latinos. Parentheses. I'm sure they would take issue with that, though, since there is a whole lot of history involved there. Panama, Panama, Panamaians. Panamanians? Panaman Panamanians hit. They have that kick-ass canal, and she wants to go on a cruise through it. All right. Love the show and all the wild shit you guys get up to. P.S. You can buy a shaker of sour, a.k.a. citric acid, at the grocery store in the pickling aisle. Don't go too crazy, Corey. You'll never stop hiccuping. P.P.S. Been wanting to clear this up since the episode aired. Elbows on the table are not rude because of pirates. It was a way to see who grew up rich and who moved up in station through hard work. Nueve rich was a bad look, and elbows on the table meant that the handsome ship's captain you wanted to marry your daughter to was actually one of the poors and not the third rich son of a viceroy or some such. Because water and water business be the way it is, stuff tends to sway back and forth and fall off tables. Plates are no different, so sailors got in the habit of placing their elbows on either side of their plates to keep it in place when they wolfed it down. So when they gained titles and went to fancy dinners, you could spot new money from a mile away. I still kind of think that's what I said, but uh, word. Well, thank you, Lady S, and thank you, everyone, out in the uh, putting on airs of verse. Uh, for sending in your letters. We appreciate y'all listening to the show. As always, like, subscribe, download, tell all your friends. Most importantly, leave us a five-star review if you think that we deserve it. And by God, I know we do. It really helps us move up in the rankings. And uh, you stay fancy, motherfuckers. Yeah. <laughs>